Good morning. Good morning. This morning we're going to continue in the series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to be in, still in the Beatitudes. Yeah, I think in another week or so, and then we'll be moving on to you'll finally learn what it means to be the salt of the earth. And so, after we keep I keep saying it every Sunday, you'll finally in a few weeks actually learn what that that's all about. So today we're looking at Matthew chapter five, verse nine, in which Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let us pray. Lord, we're just so thankful for your word. We're thankful that we can own Bibles and not have to fear of being arrested or fear of being persecuted. That although our culture has gone away from you, we still live free of that kind of persecution. That we can assemble on Sunday and not be concerned about being shut down and so Lord or going to jail. So Lord, let us rejoice in that. Let us rejoice in the fact of this teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, that these teachings will literally penetrate our hearts and change us, Lord, to become more like you. That they will be transforming and that we will take to heart what Jesus has to say in Jesus' name. Who said that? Famous quote. Who said it? Come on. Is anybody here this morning? <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. My kingdom is not of this world. Now, why would he say anything like that? What were they looking for in a Messiah? What were they looking for in a king? They were looking for a king to rule the people. Exactly. They were looking for an earthly king. They were looking for an earthly king that would be the strongest of all the kings. Mm -hmm. One that would the, the Jewish people would be the most revered people because they would have the most powerful earthly king. <coughs> but Jesus said, that's not why I came. That's not why I came. And as we look at this scripture today, keep that in mind. Because we are temporary residents here on earth. Amen. Our eternity is with him in heaven. That is where his kingdom is. God has given Satan limited authority to rule here on earth. But this is just a temporary place for us. Our home is in heaven with him where the kingdom is. Yes. All right? Yeah, Remember when we talked about poverty of spirit, about emptying ourselves, and not to remain empty, but empty ourselves so that we can be filled. And poverty of spirit, how it's related to being merciful, that we need poverty of spirit in order to show mercy, okay? If our heart has not been transformed by God, then we're probably not going to be very merciful to somebody that's in need. We're probably not going to care about them. We're probably not going to be the good Samaritan, right? And help somebody. And we talked about mourning for sin, that it's a strong conviction in a heart that we hate sin as God hates sin. And not only our sin, but the sin of others. And that we mourn about it, and we need to be in that place in order to be pure in heart. We have to have a conviction of sin in order to be pure in heart. And unfortunately today, there's too much teaching going out there in the Christian community that has no conviction of sin. It's just about what's in it for me, which, in other words, is a prosperity gospel. About me being blessed, but no conviction of sin. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we have to be deeply convicted of our sin. And mourn for it. Mourn for it. Did Jesus? Yeah. He did. Meekness. What's meekness? Well, it's related to what we're talking about today, peacemakers. In order to be meek, you need to care 
about others more than you care about yourself. And that only happens with a heart that's been transformed by God. None of these things can we do in and of ourselves without God. That's what makes these teachings so hard. If we try to apply these Beatitudes and try and do it on our own without God, we will fail. We will fail. It will not happen. These are all men that God, working in us, brings us to these places if you allow him to. If you allow him to. So, you know some examples of maybe what's not a peacemaker? You know, we talked about this before, whether it's about meekness or anything else. Just somebody that's easy going doesn't make them a peacemaker. Just because they don't really care what happens or what doesn't happen and just kind of go with the flow, that's not a peacemaker. Or a person that wants peace at any price. Have you ever heard that? Peace at any price? Meaning you're compromised what? What might you be compromising? Integrity? Violation of laws? Righteousness, okay, morality, what about an appeaser, okay? Appeaser's usually somebody, what, just kind of gives in to make peace, right? Well, it doesn't really solve, it doesn't make peace, right? It just postpones war, usually is what happens. Right? Yeah. And of course, somebody that's quarrelsome, right, it has an attitude, they're just always at conflict. You know, I did not realize until a few years ago, there are actually people that thrive on conflict. Can you imagine? Maybe you've known somebody. I have. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, it makes sense now. That there are people that thrive on having conflict. Yeah. Peacemaker does not let sleeping dogs lie. What's sleep, sleeping dogs lie? Well, if you had a couple sleeping dogs there, right? Well, if you disturb them, what happens? They may attack you, right? And so the idea is you just let them be and you don't do anything, right? Okay, and sometimes in, in businesses or companies say, okay, just, I know it's not right, but don't rock the boat. You know, just right. let the sleeping dogs lie, right? Don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Or maintain the status quo, which is another. Right? Don't rock the boat. Just let things continue the way they are. You know, don't, don't try and cause any problems. Right? Yeah. Or it does not, of course, make trouble. Right? Peacemakers doesn't purposely go into a situation to cause trouble. What he does desire is peace. Wouldn't that make sense? Peacemaker desires peace. Right? Produces peace, maintains peace. Not only does he desire it, he does something about it. Not only passively, but it requires to do something, oftentimes active, okay, as well. Only a person of a pure heart can be a peacemaker, okay? Otherwise, if you don't have a pure heart, a heart that's transformed by God, you're probably not going to be an effective peacemaker. Because you're probably, first of all, not going to care about others. You're going to care more about yourself. Right? But a heart that's been circumcised, the word we used this morning, okay, in our study in the book of Ephesians, circumcised heart is one that can be a pure heart. So, what's this mean? It means that according to this, that if you're not a Christian, you can't be a peacemaker because you're not going to have a pure heart unless it's been transformed by God. And that's true for all these Beatitudes because it requires God. It doesn't just require ourselves. What about self-interest? Have you ever thought this? I mean, our whole culture is built on individualism, right? Humanism is the fastest growing religion in our culture, even though it's growing mostly in the Christian church. What about, what is this doing to me? Or, what am I going to get out of it? What's the return? Okay, do I, I do something for you, what are you going to do for me, right? Is that attitude of Christ? 
fair. Oh man, I can't remember how many times my daughter would say this as a teenager. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair, right? We expect justice. Who delivers justice? God. That's not up to us. God. God. And what do I get in return? What's in it for me? What do I get out of it? These are all self-interest attitudes, and if you have them, they are in direct opposition to being a peacemaker. Because being a peacemaker means you are more concerned about the other person than you are about yourself. <coughs> Wife's not here, right? <laughs> Downstairs. She is the first person I ever encountered in my life that put others before self. I had never met anybody like that before I met her. I was just amazed. I'm like, what? You know? I had never seen that before in anybody. Everybody I had known was always concerned about themselves first. And to this day, she still has that attitude. I know we've heard this. Anyone who loves his life will lose it. You know? And I'm sure you've heard teachings on it and everything, but that's literally about being a peacemaker. Is you losing yourself. You're losing your self-interest to Christ. And allowing him to work in you and work through you. And you're giving up all those selfish desires and needs and wants. It's a new way to view life. Peacemakers are not common. Okay? Peacemakers are not common. It's unpopular at times to be a peacemaker, which means maybe rocking the boat. Okay? Means not allowing the status quo. Not allowing the sleeping dogs lie. It also requires, above all else, a concern about others. And we are concerned about others in here, but it, it doesn't just include this body. I mean, like Jesus says, it's easy to love those that you're in relationship with, right? But what about for the ones that you are? Here's where it becomes a real problem, especially in the churches. That too often we want to talk about other people that have offended us, okay? Or people that are difficult to deal with. And being a peacemaker, you don't talk about others in a bad tone. You don't talk about others any disparaging words you don't say. Okay? And you know, working on this, first person, you know, it has to start convicting myself, unfortunately. You know, I like to say I have it all together, but I'm sure it's obvious to everybody here that I don't. And I need as much work as anybody else in these areas. We don't ask if we're having a problem with somebody. We don't ask the question, why are they like that? Why do they do that? Why does that take place? Because they're being led by God of this world. Who's God of this world? Satan. Okay. They're being led. We have to begin to see them as victims. Okay. We have to pity them. We have to have mercy for them. We have to help them. And we have to make peace. Because, you know, I'm sure you heard separate the sin from the sinner. I mean, this is part of that, right? We all have sin, right? But we somehow have got to separate that from the person. And we're all sinners. Yeah. Okay? We have to make peace. We have to help them. There should be only one concern. One concern. It reminds me of uh, city slickers, right? There's just, I don't know if you're going to say that, it's just one thing. Just one thing. Huh. What is that? <clears throat> That's the only thing we should be concerned about. Is the glory of God. If, if, if we're having, if we're in a quarrelsome relationship, if we're having trouble, if we feel offended, then we got this is a question we've got to ask. How does this bring glory to God? Hmm. Was Jesus ever concerned about that? Oh, 
ahead. All the time. How does this glorify my Father? How does this bring glory to God? And if it doesn't, then we've got to find out how to make it so it does. I love the book of James. It's probably still my favorite book because it's just so straightforward. <laughs> it just cuts to the quick, right? And the quick to listen is, is extremely important, okay? That we're not doing all the talking, that we're listening. But the part I want to focus on is slow to speak, okay? And this is what often gets us in trouble, right? Aww. Is our tongue. <laughs> Right. <laughs> what if somebody's offended you? Sometimes the first response may be you want to reply or retaliate in some way. Or maybe you do just walk away. But what I'm encouraging here is do not reply. Why? Because what can happen? It can escalate the situation. If you remember, I don't know if your parents ever told you, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. That's basically it, right? If you don't have anything good to say, shut up. Just be quiet. I have a struggle with that a lot. I think we all do. <laughs> we all do. And it comes out of our heart. In fact, the pure in heart, you know? And only God can transform our heart. And it's why we have to continually seek Him to have our hearts transformed. Do not repeat unkind words. It doesn't help. <coughs> well, you go to somebody and say, Phil, I heard somebody saying this about you. Really? And you feel, oh, well, I'm a Christian. i got to tell him so he knows. No, you don't. Okay? You don't. If it's not worth repeating, don't repeat it. Control your tongue. You know, the person who heard it should be talking to the person who said it. Okay? And stopping it. If we hear gossip, we hear unkind things about other people, every one of us is responsibility to stop it at that time, right then. You know, and you can ask me, have you talked to that person about that yet? Have you brought that up? Has that offended you? Have you brought that up? Or, you know, whatever the situation is. No. It's better not to speak. We feel like everybody wants to hear our opinion, don't we? Everybody has a right to know what I think. And we cut out that part of listening, because I don't really care about you or what you think, but you have a right to hear what I think. Right? Conflict resolution class 101, I mean, basically. Listen and be slow to speak. Makes peace. Selfless, we talked about. Not selfish, not concerned about myself. Lovable. Yeah. Approachable. We don't stand on our dignity, meaning we're not standing on our own pride. We're not afraid to humble ourselves before somebody and seek forgiveness. We're not caught up in whether we're right or we're wrong. We're caught up in what? The relationship. That's what's important. The matters of what's right and what's wrong belong to God. What he wants us is to keep a relationship. What's Satan want? Well, Satan always wants the opposite of what God wants. And so if God wants that, he wants division. And like I said this morning, God, Satan wants division, God wants multiplication. Huh. Yeah. Literally. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants to see his numbers multiplied. Satan wants them divided and separated. So he's going to cause, Satan's going to cause anything to separate us. Whether you're a missionary or you're overseas, his biggest attack were in marriages or among team members. If he can cause conflict within marriages, conflict within a mission team, then they'll break up and they'll go back to the States. And Satan's one. That's all he's trying to do is just cause doubt, cause separation. I mean, maybe you've all been in a church that's divided, you know? That a group has decided to go off and start another church because they're not in unity with that church. You know, I don't know. But very often it doesn't turn out to be very healthy. You want to be called sons of God? 
You want to be called his people? Yes. Yeah. And we were looking again in the book of Ephesians this morning about before Christ, the Gentiles were not called sons of God. Only the Jewish people were. And then because of Christ's blood, we can all be called Amen. sons of God by the blood of the Lamb. You ever thought about what that word called means? <coughs> You know, we don't, and we talked about this before, we don't like the word slave. That's literally what we're supposed to be to God. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, servant sounds much better than slave, but God, as his people, he owns us. We are his people. Amen. We belong to him. Right? God Almighty. Ch children of God. If you are a peacemaker, you are called gods. You are called gods. I'm sorry, you are called God's people. You are owned by him. In Hebrews chapter 13 says, Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. The God of peace. Have you ever been really unsettled? And you just prayed to God and reached out to him and opened your heart and Ask for God to descend upon you and give you peace. Yes. Did he? Yes. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Can you find it anywhere else? No. God of peace. Holy, just, righteous. Absolute. God of peace. Send his son. Send his son. To do what? To die. He sent his son to die. That was his mission, to die. Why? To reconcile us back to God because we had broken relationship. You know, originally, we were perfect. And we lived in paradise, right? And then the fall came. But God sent his son so that we could be reconciled with him. There is no other way. We can't do it in and of ourselves. There is no other way. There is no other way. People criticize Christianity because they said you are exclusive. You say that's the only way to heaven. Yeah? I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's clear to us that is the only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there is no other way. In Taiwan, they just want to add Jesus, put another idol on the shelf. They want to cover all their bases. But it doesn't work that way. you got to cast out all those other idols. you got to cast out all those other gods and believe in only one. And that's through Jesus Christ. And because of his blood, we have been reconciled. We have been saved. That is our way of salvation. He came and he did something. Right? He did something for us. He did. Why? Because he loved us. And he is called the Prince of Peace. Because he's reconciled us to God. Right? Colossians says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. Yeah. You know, I used to always think, I always used to think blood was like death. You know, when you see blood, it's all associated with death. Well, I think that's what Satan wants us to think. But for us, blood is life. It's not death, it's life. Life everlasting. Jesus Christ came. Was he concerned about his rights? Was he concerned about his privileges? Was he concerned about his deity? No. I mean, if he wasn't concerned, should we? I mean, he had a lot more claims than we do. Yeah. He's God. Fully human and fully God. <laughs> Yet he was willing to humble himself. Be born. I mean, he could have come as an adult man at 30 and just spend his three years in ministry. But no. Born of a virgin in a manger or a cave, whatever. 
humble, 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 to humble, poor parents. Joseph was so poor. I mean, they offered doves. They didn't even, they couldn't even, they didn't even have able to bring a lamb for sacrifice. So we know they were poor. And who did he give the glory to? Isn't any of this overwhelming? I mean, by the mercy, by the compassion, by the grace, by the kindness of God, we should be overwhelmed. That he would send his only son to suffer and to die on the cross so that we could be reconciled back to God the Father. That we can have a relationship again with God the Father. Because until Jesus came, the relationship had been broken. There was no relationship. I want to read something. Whew. This scripture showed up this morning in our Bible study. And I'm like, it's just amazing. You know, I don't look at this study on Ephesians and then plan the sermons. I'm both on a track on what's going on there and a track going through the Sermon of the Mount. But in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning, we're looking beginning with verse 14. Uh, let's start with verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, who once were far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Before the blood of Christ, we had no hope. <coughs> All of us sitting here, unless you're a Jew. We didn't have a hope. Because in the blood of the Lamb, we now have our hope in Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. Amen. Who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So because of the blood of the Lamb and Jesus going to the cross, that wall, that barrier between us and God has been broken. That was that symbolized when Christ died on the cross. That curtain was torn. Do you remember that? In the sanctuary, this huge curtain was torn, which was symbolic in that the wall was taken down between us and the Holy of Holies. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, because of Jesus Christ, we no longer have to live by the law. Which was impossible to do. Are we to follow the law? Yes. You know, we're still not expected to murder, kill, steal, you know, all those things. But Jesus fulfilled the law for us. And because of Jesus, now, especially now, God's after our heart. I mean, he always was. But that's what Jesus exposed in the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, was their hearts were hard outside, they looked righteous, but inside they were full of poison and evil. And I don't think I don't think any of those religious leaders of that day were peacemakers. Because Jesus exposed their hearts and they were not pure in heart. So how could they be? Do you feel like you're peacemakers? Yeah, sometimes maybe. We're all works in progress. Amen. I mean, praise the Lord that He grants us that grace. But He also is looking for us to continue to move and not stagnate. To continue to move and become more like Christ each and every day. And so, no, we don't. We don't have it all down. We don't have all the answers. The idea is that each day we submit our hearts to Christ Jesus and allow him to work in us and help us to become better peacemakers. Help us to become meek, pure in heart, willing to look at others before we look at ourselves. Not to ask the question, 
that wasn't fair, or was that fair? What's in it for me? We need to die to that. That's part of dying to self, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Jesus said, and it's pretty clear, is the Bible offensive? Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. Is it outdated? No, it's not. Culture may change. That doesn't mean that the Bible changes. It doesn't mean that we are to do anything different just because the culture we live in has accepted things that are against the Bible. One of the best ways to lose that, those selfish desires and things, is sometimes to go on a mission trip. Okay. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of missionaries in the field don't want to bother, don't want to take the time to host short-term mission trips because some, they, just, they just see it as an inconvenience. However, I saw it as a welcome opportunity because usually the people that come on these short-term mission trips, their eyes are open. Now, probably they're not going to become missionaries, but their eyes have been open, and, and um, once they're open, they realize how fortunate and how blessed on many occasions that they are, how many things they've taken for granted, and sometimes start losing that own what is it for me attitude and start, you know, how can I help them? How can I help others? What can I do for them? That, that group that went there was Big Daddy Weave and the heavy set gentleman that was Big Daddy, I guess, whatever, he's the leader of the group and they went on this world vision trip to Tanzania. I don't know. Maybe this is something we need to pray about as a congregation. If we should look at, and we don't have to go all the way to Africa, but maybe there's a short-term mission trip we can go on to maybe here even in America or something. Because it will open your eyes. You know, it does open your eyes. And so, yes? I'm sorry, I just no, have go ahead, one please. last thing to yeah. say, now that you say Africa. My grandson was shipped out yesterday to Africa, and I would just ask that everyone would just pray for a safe return. Uh, he'll be out there for six months. And Can do mission work? Yeah, okay. he's uh, in the Army, he's oh, Special okay. Forces, and he'll be out there for six months, and I just want the congregation to okay. pray for a safe return. What's his What's name? His name? Ruben Cortez. Ruben Cortez. So, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Hopefully this gives you a little insight into what it means to be a peacemaker. Basically, I think if you're nothing else and you walk out of here is remember die to self. I mean, that's that's the big thing. You start seeing other people more important in relationship more important than your own selfishness. <coughs> Let's pray. Lord, we just thankful for this opportunity to learn and study from your word. Help your word transform our hearts, Lord, and help it can help it us to be convicted by your Thank you for these teachings that Jesus did on the mount. And may we, they not fall on deaf ears, but fall on ears that want to hear and hearts that want to change. In Jesus' name.